Chapter Twelve of the Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve, Tragical History of Princess of X. More than twenty years after the events described in the past chapters, I was walking with my lady Lyndon in the rotunda at Ranelagh. It was in the year seventeen ninety. The immigration from France had already commenced. The old counts and marquises were thronging to our shores, not starving and miserable as one saw them a few years afterwards, but unmolested as yet, and bringing with them some token of their national splendor. I was walking with Lady Lyndon, who, proverbially jealous and always anxious to annoy me, spied out a foreign lady who was evidently remarking me and, of course, asked who was the hideous, fat Dutchwoman who was leering at me so. I knew her not in the least. I felt I had seen the lady's face somewhere. It was now, as my wife said, enormously fat and bloated. But I did not recognize in the bearer of that face one who had been among the most beautiful women in Germany in her day. It was no other than Madame de Liliengarten, the mistress, or, as some said, the morganatic wife, of the old Duke of X, Duke Victor's father. She had left X a few months after the elder Duke's demise, had gone to Paris, as I heard, where some unprincipled adventurer had married her for her money, but, however, had always retained her quasi-royal title, and pretended, amidst the great laughter of the Parisians who frequented her house, to the honours and ceremonial of a sovereign's widow. She had a throne erected in her stateroom, and was styled by her servants and those who wished to pay court to her, or borrow money from her, Altesse. Reports say she drank rather copiously. Certainly her face bore every mark of that habit, and had lost the rosy, frank, good-humoured beauty which had charmed the sovereign who had ennobled her. Although she did not address me in the circle at Ranelagh, I was at this period as well known as the Prince of Wales, and she had no difficulty in finding my house in Berkeley Square, whither a note was next morning dispatched to me. An old friend of Monsieur de Balibarri, it stated, in extremely bad French, is anxious to see the Chevalier again and to talk over happy times. Rosina de Liliengarten, can it be that Redmond Balibarri has forgotten her? will be at her house in Leicester Fields all the morning, looking for one who would never have passed her by twenty years ago. Rosina of Liliengarten it was indeed. Such a full-blown Rosina I have seldom seen. I found her in a decent first floor in Leicester Fields. The poor soul fell much lower afterwards, drinking tea, which had somehow a very strong smell of brandy in it and after salutations, which would be more tedious to recount than they were to perform, and after further straggling conversation, she gave me briefly the following narrative of the events in X, which I may well entitle The Princess's Tragedy. You remember Monsieur de Geldern, the police minister. He was of Dutch extraction, and, what is more, of a family of Dutch Jews. Although everybody was aware of this blot in his scutcheon, he was mortally angry if ever his origin was suspected, and made up for his father's errors by outrageous professions of religion, and the most austere practices of devotion. He visited church every morning, confessed once a week, and hated Jews and Protestants as much as an inquisitor could do. He never lost an opportunity of proving his sincerity by persecuting one or the other whenever occasion fell in his way. He hated the princess mortally, for her highness in some whim had insulted him with his origin, caused pork to be removed from before him at table, or injured him in some such silly way, and he had a violent animosity to the old Baron de Mani, both in his capacity of Protestant, and because the latter, in some haughty mood, had publicly turned his back upon him as a sharper and a spy. Perpetual quarrels were taking place between them in council, where it was only the presence of his august masters that restrained the baron 
from publicly and frequently expressing the contempt which he felt for the officer of police. Thus Geldern had hatred as one reason for ruining the princess, and it is my belief he had a stronger motive still. Interest. You remember whom the duke married after the death of his first wife? A princess of the house of F., Geldern built his fine palace two years after, and, as I feel convinced, with the money which was paid to him by the F. family for forwarding the match. To go to Prince Victor and report to His Highness a case which everybody knew was not by any means Geldern's desire. He knew the man would be ruined forever in the prince's estimation who carried him intelligence so disastrous. His aim, therefore, was to leave the matter to explain itself to his highness, and, when the time was ripe, he cast about for a means of carrying his point. He had spies in the houses of the elder and younger Mani, but this you know, of course, from your experience of continental customs. We had all spies over each other. Your black, Zamor, I think was his name, used to give me reports every morning and I used to entertain the dear old duke with stories of you and your uncle practicing piquet and dice in the morning, and with your quarrels and intrigues. We levied similar contributions on everybody in X, to amuse the dear old man. Monsieur de Manis' valet used to report both to me and Monsieur de Geldern. I knew of the fact of the emerald being in pawn, and it was out of my exchequer that the poor princess drew the funds which were spent upon the odious low and the still more worthless young chevalier. How the princess could trust the latter as she persisted in doing is beyond my comprehension, but there is no infatuation like that of a woman in love. And you will remark, my dear Monsieur de Balibarri, that our sex generally fix upon a bad man. Not always, madam, I interposed. Your humble servant has created many such attachments. I do not see that that affects the truth of the proposition, said the old lady dryly, and continued her narrative. The Jew who had the emerald had many dealings with the princess, and at last was offered a bribe of such magnitude that he determined to give up the pledge. He committed the inconceivable imprudence of bringing the emerald with him to X, and waited on Mani, who was provided by the princess with money to redeem the pledge, and was actually ready to pay it. Their interview took place in Manny's own apartments, when his valet overheard every word of their conversation. The young man, who was always utterly careless of money when it was in his possession, was so easy in offering it, that Lowe rose in his demands, and had the conscience to ask double the sum for which he had previously stipulated. At this the Chevalier lost all patience, fell on the wretch, and was for killing him, when the opportune valet rushed in and saved him. The man had heard every word of the conversation between the disputants, and the Jew ran flying with terror into his arms, and Mani, a quick and passionate but not a violent man, bade the servant lead the villain downstairs and thought no more of him. Perhaps he was not sorry to be rid of him, and to have in his possession a large sum of money, four thousand ducats, with which he could tempt fortune once more, as you know he did at your table that night. "'Your ladyship went halves, madam,' said I, "'and you know how little I was the better for my winnings.' Mm. The man conducted the trembling Israelite out of the palace, and no sooner had seen him lodged at the house of one of his brethren, where he was accustomed to put up, than he went away to the office of His Excellency the Minister of Police, and narrated every word of the conversation which had taken place between the Jew and his master. Geldern expressed the greatest satisfaction at his spy's prudence and fidelity. He gave him a purse of twenty ducats, and promised to provide for him handsomely, as great men do sometimes promise to reward their instruments. But you, Monsieur de Baribarri, know how seldom those promises are kept. Now go and find out, said Monsieur de Geldern, at which time the Israelite proposes to return home again, or whether he will repent and take the money. The man went on this errand. Meanwhile, to make matters sure, Geldern arranged a play-party at my house, 
inviting you thither with your bank, as you may remember, and finding means at the same time to let Maxime de Manny know that there was to be Pharaoh at Madame de Lilliengarten's. It was an invitation the poor fellow never neglected. I remembered the facts, and listened on, amazed at the artifice of the infernal minister of police. The spy came back from his message to Lowe, and stated that he had made inquiries among the servants of the house where the Heidelberg banker lodged, and that it was the latter's intention to leave X that afternoon. He travelled by himself, riding an old horse, exceedingly humbly attired, after the manner of his people. Johann, said the minister, clapping the pleased spy upon the shoulder, I am more and more pleased with you. I have been thinking since you left me of your intelligence and the faithful manner in which you served me, and shall soon find an occasion to place you according to your merits. Which way does this Israelitish scoundrel take? He goes to R tonight. And must pass by the Kaiserwald. Are you a man of courage, Johann Kerner? Will your excellency try me? said the man, his eyes glittering. I served through the Seven Years' War, and was never known to fail there. Mm, now listen. The emerald must be taken from that Jew. In the very keeping it the scoundrel has committed high treason. To the man who brings me that emerald I swear I will give five hundred louis. You understand why it is necessary that it should be restored to Her Highness. I need say no more. You shall have it tonight, sir, said the man. Of course your excellency will hold me harmless in case of accident. Shah, answered the minister, I'll pay you half the money beforehand, such is my confidence in you. Accident's impossible if you take your measures properly. There are four leagues of wood. The Jew rides slowly. It will be night before he can reach, let us say, the old powder mill in the wood. What's to prevent you from putting a rope across the road and dealing with him there? Be back with me this evening at supper. If you meet any of the patrol, say, foxes are loose. That's the word for tonight. They will let you pass them without questions. The man went off quite charmed with his commission, and when Mani was losing his money at our faro table, his servant waylaid the Jew at the spot named the powder mill in the Kaiserwald. The Jew's horse stumbled over a rope which had been placed across the road, and as the rider fell groaning to the ground, Johann Kerner rushed out on him, masked and pistol in hand, and demanded his money. He had no wish to kill the Jew, I believe, unless his resistance should render extreme measures necessary. Nor did he commit any such murder, for, as the yelling Jew roared for mercy and his assailant menaced him with a pistol, a squad of patrol came up, and laid hold of the robber and the wounded man. Kerner swore an oath. "'You have come too soon,' said he to the sergeant of police. "'Foxes are loose.' "'Some are caught,' said the sergeant, quite unconcerned, and bound the fellow's hands with the rope which he had stretched across the road to entrap the Jew. He was placed behind the policeman on a horse, Lowe was similarly accommodated, and the party thus came back into the town as the night fell. They were taken forthwith to the police quarter, and, as the chief happened to be there, they were examined by His Excellency in person. Both were rigorously searched. The Jew's papers and cases taken from him. The jewel was found in a private pocket. As for the spy, the minister, looking at him angrily, said, why, this is the servant of the Chevalier de Manny, one of Her Highness's equerries. And without hearing a word in exculpation from the poor frightened wretch, ordered him into close confinement. Calling for his horse, he then rode to the prince's apartments at the palace, and asked for an instant audience. When admitted, he produced the emerald. This jewel, said he, has been found on the person of a Heidelberg Jew, who has been here repeatedly of late, and has had many dealings with Her Highness's equerry, the Chevalier de Magny. This afternoon the Chevalier's servant came from his master's lodgings, accompanied by a Hebrew, 
was heard to make inquiries as to the route the man intended to take on his way homewards, followed him, or preceded him, rather, and was found in the act of rifling his victim by my police in the Kaiserwald. The man will confess nothing, but, on being searched, a large sum in gold was found on his person, and though it is with the utmost pain that I can bring myself to entertain such an opinion, and to implicate a gentleman of the character and name of M. de Manny, I do submit that our duty is to have the Chevalier examined relative to the affair. As M. de Manny is in Her Highness's private service, and in her confidence I have heard, I would not venture to apprehend him without Your Highness's permission. The Prince's Master of the Horse, a friend of the old Baron de Manny, who was present at the interview, no sooner heard the strange intelligence than he hastened away to the old general, with the dreadful news of his grandson's supposed crime. Perhaps his highness himself was not unwilling that his old friend and tutor in arms should have the chance of saving his family from disgrace. At all events, Monsieur de Hengst, the master of the horse, was permitted to go off to the baron undisturbed and break to him the intelligence of the accusation pending over the unfortunate Chevalier. It is possible that he expected some such dreadful catastrophe, for, after hearing Hengst's narrative, as the latter afterwards told me, he only said, Heaven's will be done, for some time refused to stir a step in the matter, and then only by the solicitation of his friend was induced to write the letter which Maxime de Magny received at our play-table. Whilst he was there, squandering the princess's money, a police visit was paid to his apartments, and a hundred proofs, not of his guilt with respect to the robbery, but of his guilty connection with the princess, were discovered there. Tokens of her giving, passionate letters from her, copies of his own correspondence to his young friends at Paris, all of which the police minister perused, and carefully put together under seal for his highness Prince Victor. I have no doubt he perused them, for, on delivering them to the hereditary prince, Geldern said that, in obedience to his highness's orders, he had collected the chevalier's papers. But he need not say that, on his honor, he, Geldern, himself, had never examined the documents. His difference with M. de Manny was known, he begged his highness to employ any other official person in the judgment of the accusation brought against the young chevalier. All these things were going on while the chevalier was at play. A run of luck, you had great luck in those days, Monsieur de Balibarri, was against him. He stayed and lost his four thousand ducats. He received his uncle's note, and such was the infatuation of the wretched gambler that, on receipt of it, he went down to the courtyard where the horse was in waiting, absolutely took the money which the poor old gentleman had placed in the saddle holsters, brought it upstairs, played it, and lost it. And when he issued from the room to fly, it was too late. He was placed in arrest at the bottom of my staircase, as you were upon entering your own home. Even when he came in under the charge of the soldiery sent to arrest him, the old general who was waiting was overjoyed to see him, and flung himself into the lad's arms and embraced him. It was said for the first time in many years. "'He is here, gentlemen,' he sobbed out. "'Thank God he is not guilty of the robbery,' and then sank back in a chair in a burst of emotion. Painful, it was said by those present, to witness on the part of a man so brave, and known to be so cold and stern. "'Robbery,' said the young man. I swear before heaven I am guilty of none. And a scene of almost touching reconciliation passed between them, before the unhappy young man was led from the guardhouse into the prison, which he was destined never to quit. That night the Duke looked over the papers which Geldern had brought to him. It was at a very early stage of the perusal, no doubt, that he gave orders for your arrest, for you were taken at midnight. Mani at ten o'clock, after which time the old Baron de Mani had seen his highness protesting of his grandson's innocence, and the prince had received him most graciously and kindly. 
His highness said he had no doubt the young man was innocent. His birth and his blood rendered such a crime impossible. But suspicion was too strong against him. He was known to have been that day closeted with the Jew, to have received a very large sum of money which he squandered at play, and of which the Hebrew had doubtless been the lender, to have dispatched his servant after him, who inquired the hour of the Jew's departure, lay in wait for him, and rifled him. Suspicion was so strong against the Chevalier that common justice required his arrest, and meanwhile, until he cleared himself, he should be kept in not dishonorable durance, and every regard had for his name and the services of his honorable grandfather. With this assurance, and with a warm grasp of the hand, the prince left old General de Magny that night, and the veteran retired to rest almost consoled and confident in Maxime's eventual and immediate release. But in the morning, before daybreak, the prince, who had been reading papers all night, wildly called to the page, who slept in the next room across the door, bade him get horses, which were always kept in readiness in the stables, and, flinging a parcel of letters into a box, told the page to follow him on horseback with these. The young man, Monsieur de Weissenborn, told this to a young lady who was then of my household, and who is now Madame de Weissenborn, and a mother of a score of children. The page described that never was such a change seen as in his august master in the course of that single night. His eyes were bloodshot, his face livid, his clothes were hanging loose about him, and he who had always made his appearance on parade as precisely dressed as any sergeant of his troops might have been seen galloping through the lonely streets at early dawn without a hat, his unpowdered hair streaming behind him like a madman. The page, with the box of papers, clattered after his master. It was no easy task to follow him, and they rode from the palace to the town and through it to the general's quarter. The sentinels at the door were scared at the strange figure that rushed up to the general's gate, and, not knowing him, crossed bayonets and refused him admission. Fools, said Weissenborn, it is the prince. And, jangling at the bell as if for an alarm of fire, the door was at length opened by the porter, and his highness ran up to the general's bedchamber, followed by the page with the box. Mani, Mani, roared the prince, thundering at the closed door. Get up! And to the queries of the old man from within answered, it is I, Victor, the prince, get up! And presently the door was opened by the general in his robe de chambre, and the prince entered. The page brought in the box, and was bidden to wait without, which he did. But there led from Monsieur de Manny's bedroom into his antechamber two doors, the great one which formed the entrance into his room, and a smaller one which led, as the fashion is with our houses abroad, into the closet which communicates with the alcove where the bed is. The door of this was found by M. de Weissenborn to be open, and the young man was thus enabled to hear and see everything which occurred within the apartment. The general, somewhat nervously, asked what was the reason of so early a visit from his highness, to which the prince did not for a while reply, farther than by staring at him rather wildly and pacing up and down the room. At last he said, Here is the cause, dashing his fist on the box, and, as he had forgotten to bring the key with him, he went to the door for a moment, saying, Weissenborn perhaps has it. But seeing over the stove one of the general's couteaux de chasse, he took it down and said, That will do, and fell to work to burst the red trunk open with the blade of the forest knife. The point broke, and he gave an oath but continued haggling on with the broken blade, which was better suited to his purpose than the long pointed knife, and finally succeeded in wrenching open the lid of the chest. "'What is the matter?' said he, laughing. "'Here's the matter. Read that. Here's more matter. Read that. Here's more. No, not that. That's somebody else's picture. But here's hers. Do you know that, Manny?' my wife's, the princess's. Why did you and your cursed race ever come out of France 
to plant your infernal wickedness wherever your feet fell and to ruin honest german homes what have you and yours ever had from my family but confidence and kindness we gave you a home when you had none and here is our reward and he flung a parcel of papers down before the old general who saw the truth at once he had known it long before probably and sank down on his chair covering his face the prince went on gesticulating and shrieking almost if a man injured you so many before you begot the father of that gambling lying villain yonder you would have known how to revenge yourself you would have killed him yes would have killed him but who's to help me to my revenge i've no equal i can't meet that dog of a frenchman that pimp from versailles and kill him as if he had played the traitor to one of his own degree the blood of maxime de magny said the old gentleman proudly is as good as that of any prince in christendom can i take it cried the prince you know i can't i can't have the privilege of any other gentleman in europe what am i to do look here manny i, I was wild when i came here I, I didn't know what to do you've served me for thirty years you've saved my life twice they're all knaves and harlots about my poor old father here no honest men or women you're the only one you saved my life tell me what am i to do thus from insulting m de magny the poor distracted prince fell to supplicating him and at last fairly flung himself down and burst out in an agony of tears old magny one of the most rigid and cold of men on common occasions when he saw this outbreak of passion on the prince's part became as my informant has described to me as much affected as his master the old man from being cold and high suddenly fell as it were into the whimpering querulousness of extreme old age he lost all sense of dignity he went down on his knees and broke out into all sorts of wild incoherent attempts at consolation so much so that weissenborn said he could not bear to look at the scene and actually turned away from the contemplation of it but from what followed in a few days we may guess the results of the long interview the prince when he came away from the conversation with his old servant forgot his fatal box of papers and set the page back for them the general was on his knees praying in the room when the young man entered and only stirred and looked wildly round as the other removed the packet the prince rode away to his hunting lodge at three leagues from x and three days after that maxime de magny died in prison having made a confession that he was engaged in an attempt to rob the jew and that he had made away with himself ashamed of his dishonor but it is not known that it was the general himself who took his grandson poison it was said even that he shot him in the prison this however was not the case general de magny carried his grandson the draft which was to carry him out of the world represented to the wretched youth that his fate was inevitable that it would be public and disgraceful unless he chose to anticipate the punishment and so left him but it was not of his own accord and not until he had used every means of escape as you shall hear that the unfortunate being's life was brought to an end as for general de Manny, he quite fell into imbecility a short time after his grandson's death and my honoured duke's demise after his highness the prince married the princess mary of f as they were walking in the english park together they once met old Manny riding in the sun in the easy chair in which he was carried commonly abroad after his paralytic fits this is my wife Manny, said the prince affectionately taking the veteran's hand and he added turning to his princess general de Manny saved my life during the seven years war what you've taken her back again said the old man i wish you'd send me back my poor maxime he had quite forgotten the death of the poor princess olivia and the prince 
looking very dark indeed, passed away. And now, said Madame de Lilliengarten, I have only one more gloomy story to relate to you. The death of the Princess Olivia. It is even more horrible than the tale I have just told you. With which preface the old lady resumed her narrative. The kind, weak princess's fate was hastened, if not occasioned, by the cowardice of Magny. He found means to communicate with her from his prison, and her highness, who was not in open disgrace yet, for the duke, out of regard to the family, persisted in charging Magny with only robbery, made the most desperate attempts to relieve him and to bribe the jailers to effect his escape. She was so wild that she lost all patience and prudence in the conduct of any schemes she may have had for Manny's liberation, for her husband was inexorable, and caused the Chevalier's prison to be too strictly guarded for escape to be possible. She offered the state jewels in pawn to the court banker, who of course was obliged to decline the transaction. She fell down on her knees, it is said, to Geldern, the police minister, and offered him heaven knows what as a bribe. Finally, she came screaming to my poor dear duke, who, with his age, diseases, and easy habits, was quite unfit for scenes of so violent a nature, and who, in consequence of the excitement created in his august bosom by her frantic violence and grief, had a fit in which I very nigh lost him. That his dear life was brought to an untimely end by these transactions I have not the slightest doubt for the Strasbourg pie of which they said he died, never, I am sure, could have injured him, but for the injury which his dear gentle heart received from the unusual occurrences in which he was forced to take a share. All her highness's movements were carefully, though not ostensibly, watched by her husband, Prince Victor, who, waiting upon his august father, sternly signified to him that if his highness, my duke, should dare to aid the princess in her efforts to release Manny, he, Prince Victor, would publicly accuse the princess and her paramour of high treason, and take measures with the Diet for removing his father from the throne, as incapacitated to reign. Hence interposition on my part was vain, and Manny was left to his fate. It came, as you are aware, very suddenly. Geldern, police minister, Hengst, master of the horse, and the colonel of the prince's guard, waited upon the young man in his prison two days after his grandfather had visited there, and left behind him the phial of poison, which the criminal had not the courage to use. And Geldern signified to the man that unless he took of his own accord the laurel water provided by the elder Mani, more violent means of death would be instantly employed upon him and that a file of grenadiers was waiting in the courtyard to dispatch him. Seeing this, Magny, with the most dreadful self-abasement, after dragging himself round the room on his knees from one officer to another, weeping and screaming with terror, at last desperately drank off the potion, and was a corpse in a few minutes. Thus ended this wretched young man. His death was made public in the court gazette two days after, the paragraph stating that Monsieur de M., struck with remorse for having attempted the murder of the Jew, had put himself to death by poison in prison, and a warning was added to all young noblemen of the duchy to avoid the dreadful sin of gambling, which had been the cause of the young man's ruin, and had brought upon the grey hairs of one of the noblest and most honourable of the servants of the duke irretrievable sorrow. The funeral was conducted with decent privacy, the General de Mani attending it. The carriages of the two dukes and all the first people of the court made their calls upon the general afterwards. He attended parade as usual the next day on the Arsenal Place, and Duke Victor, who had been inspecting the building, came out of it leaning on the brave old warrior's arm. He was particularly gracious to the old man, and told his officers the oft-repeated story how at Rosbach, when the ex-contingent served with the troops of the unlucky Soubies, the general had thrown himself in the way of a French dragoon, who was pressing hard upon his highness in the rout, had received the blow intended for his master, and killed the assailant. 
and he alluded to the family motto of Manie sans tache, and said it had always been so with his gallant friend and tutor in arms. This speech affected all present very much, with the exception of the old general, who only bowed and did not speak. But when he went home he was heard muttering, Manie sans tache, Manie sans tache, and was attacked with paralysis that night from which he never more than partially recovered. The news of Maxime's death had somehow been kept from the princess until now. A gazette even being printed without the paragraph containing the account of his suicide. But it was at length, I know not how, made known to her. And when she heard it, her ladies tell me, she screamed and fell as if struck dead, then sat up wildly and raved like a madwoman, and was then carried to her bed, where her physician attended her and where she lay of a brain fever. All this while the prince used to send to make inquiries concerning her, and from his giving orders that his castle of Schlangenfels should be prepared and furnished, I make no doubt it was his intention to send her into confinement thither, as had been done with the unhappy sister of his Britannic majesty at Zell. She sent repeatedly to demand an interview with his highness, which the latter declined, saying that he would communicate with her highness when her health was sufficiently recovered. To one of her passionate letters he sent back for reply a packet which, when opened, was found to contain the emerald that had been the cause round which all this dark intrigue moved. Her highness at this time became quite frantic, vowed in the presence of all her ladies that one lock of her darling Maxime's hair was more precious to her than all the jewels in the world rang for her carriage and said she would go and kiss his tomb, proclaimed the murdered martyr's innocence, and called down the punishment of heaven, the wrath of her family, upon his assassin. The prince, on hearing these speeches, they were all, of course, regularly brought to him, is said to have given one of his dreadful looks, which I remember now, and to have said, This cannot last much longer. All that day and the next the Princess Olivia passed in dictating the most passionate letters to the Prince her father, to the kings of France, Naples, and Spain, her kinsmen, and to all other branches of her family, calling upon them in the most incoherent terms to protect her against the butcher and assassin, her husband, assailing his person in the maddest terms of reproach, and at the same time confessing her love for the murdered Mani. It was in vain that those ladies who were faithful to her pointed out to her the inutility of these letters, the dangerous follies of the confessions which they made. She insisted upon writing them, and used to give them to her second robe-woman, a Frenchwoman, her highness always affectioned persons of that nation, who had the key of her cassette, and carried every one of these epistles to Geldern. With the exception that no public receptions were held, the ceremony of the princess's establishment went on as before. Her ladies were allowed to wait upon her and perform their usual duties about her person. The only men admitted were, however, her servants, her physician, and chaplain. And one day when she wished to go into the garden, a hayduke who kept the door intimated to her highness that the prince's orders were that she should keep to her apartments. They abut, as you remember, upon the landing of a marble staircase of Schloss X, the entrance to Prince Victor's suite of rooms being opposite the princess's on the same landing. This space is large, filled with sofas and benches, and the gentlemen and officers who waited upon the duke used to make a sort of antechamber of the landing place, and pay their court to his highness there, as he passed out at eleven o'clock, to parade. At such a time, the Haydukes within the princess's suite of rooms used to turn out with their halberts and present to Prince Victor, the same ceremony being presented on his own side when pages came out and announced the approach of his highness. The pages used to come out and say, The prince, gentlemen, and the drums beat in the hall, and the gentlemen rose, who were waiting on the benches that ran along the balustrade. As if fate impelled her to her death, one day the princess, as her guards turned out, and she was aware that the prince was standing, as was his wont, on the landing, conversing with his gentlemen, 
In the old days he used to cross to the princess's apartment and kiss her hand. The princess, who had been anxious all the morning complaining of heat, insisting that all the doors of the apartments should be left open, and giving tokens of an insanity which, I think, was now evident, rushed wildly at the doors where the guards passed out, flung them open, and before a word could be said or her ladies could follow her, was in the presence of Duke Victor, who was talking as usual on the landing. Placing herself between him and the stair, she began apostrophizing him with frantic vehemence. "'Take notice, gentlemen,' she screamed out, "'that this man is a murderer and a liar, "'that he lays plots for honorable gentlemen "'and kills them in prison. "'Take notice, too, that I am in prison "'and fear the same fate. "'The same butcher who killed Maxime de Mani "'may, any night, put the knife to my throat. "'I appeal to you and to all the kings of Europe, "'my royal kinsmen. "'I demand to be set free from this evil tyrant and villain.' this liar and traitor i adjure you all as gentlemen of honour to carry these letters to my relatives and say from whom you had them and with this the unhappy lady began scattering letters about among the astonished crowd let no man stoop cried the prince in a voice of thunder madame de glaim you should have watched your patient better call the princess's physicians her highness's brain is affected "'Gentlemen, have the goodness to retire.' And the prince stood on the landing as the gentleman went down the stairs, saying fiercely to the guard, "'Soldier, if she moves, strike with your halberd.' On which the man brought the point of his weapon to the princess's breast, and the lady, frightened, shrank back and re-entered her apartments. "'Now, Monsieur de Weissenborn,' said the prince, "'pick up all those papers.' And the prince went into his own apartments, preceded by his pages, and never quitted them until he had seen every one of the papers burnt. The next day the court gazette contained a bulletin signed by the three physicians, stating that Her Highness the Hereditary Princess labored under inflammation of the brain, and had passed a restless and disturbed night. Similar notices were issued day after day. The services of all her ladies except two were dispensed with. Guards were placed within and without her doors. Her windows were secured, so that escape from them was impossible. And you know what took place ten days after. The church bells were ringing all night, and the prayers of the faithful asked for a person in extremis. A gazette appeared in the morning, edged with black, and stating that the high and mighty Princess Olivia Maria Ferdinanda, consort of His Serene Highness Victor Louis Emmanuel, hereditary prince of X, had died in the evening of the 24th of January, 1769. But do you know how she died, sir? That, too, is a mystery. Weissenborn, the page, was concerned in this dark tragedy, and the secret was so dreadful that never, believe me, till Prince Victor's death did I reveal it. After the fatal esclange which the princess had made, the prince sent for Weissenborn, and binding him by the most solemn adjuration to secrecy, he only broke it to his wife many years after, indeed there is no secret in the world that women cannot know if they will, dispatched him on the following mysterious commission. There lives, said his highness, on the Kale side of the river, opposite to Strasbourg, a man whose residence you will easily find out from his name, which is Monsieur de Strasbourg. You will make your inquiries concerning him quietly, and without occasioning any remark. Perhaps you had better go into Strasbourg for the purpose, where the person is quite well known. You will take with you any comrade on whom you can perfectly rely. The lives of both, remember, depend on your secrecy. You will find out some period when Monsieur de Strasbourg is alone, or only in company of the domestic who lives with him. I myself visited the man by accident on my return from Paris five years since, and hence am induced to send for him now, in my present emergency. You will have your carriage waiting at his door at night, and you and your comrade will enter the house masked, and present him with a purse of a hundred louis, promising him double that sum on his return from the expedition. If you refuse, you must use force and bring him, 
menacing him with instant death should he decline to follow you. You will place him in the carriage with the blinds drawn, one or the other of you never losing sight of him the whole way, and threatening him with death if he discover himself or cry out. You will lodge him in the old tower here, where a room shall be prepared for him, and his work being done, you will restore him to his home with the same speed and secrecy with which you brought him from it. Such were the mysterious orders Prince Victor gave his page, and Weissenborn, selecting for his comrade in the expedition, Lieutenant Bartenstein, set out on his strange journey. All this while the palace was hushed, as if in mourning. The bulletins in the court gazette appeared, announcing the continuance of the princess's malady, and though she had but few attendants, strange and circumstantial stories were told regarding the progress of her complaint. She was quite wild. She had tried to kill herself. She had fancied herself to be I don't know how many different characters. Expresses were sent to her family informing them of her state, and couriers dispatched publicly to Vienna and Paris to procure the attendance of physicians skilled in treating diseases of the brain. The pretended anxiety was all a faint. It was never intended that the princess should recover. The day on which Weissenborn and Bartenstein returned from their expedition, it was announced that Her Highness the Princess was much worse. That night the report through the town was that she was at the agony, and that night the unfortunate creature was endeavouring to make her escape. She had unlimited confidence in the French chamberwoman who attended her, and between her and this woman the plan of escape was arranged. The princess took her jewels in a casket. A private door, opening from one of her rooms and leading into the outer gate, it is said, of the palace, was discovered for her, and a letter was brought to her, purporting to be from the duke her father-in-law, stating that a carriage and horses had been provided and would take her to B, the territory where she might communicate with her family and be safe. The unhappy lady, confiding in her guardian, set out on the expedition. The passengers wound through the walls of the modern part of the palace, and abutted in effect at the Owl Tower, as it was called, on the outer wall. The tower was pulled down afterwards, and for good reason. At a certain place the candle, which the chamberwoman was carrying, went out, and the princess would have screamed with terror, but her hand was seized, and a voice cried, Hush! The next minute a man in a mask, it was the duke himself, rushed forward, gagged her with a handkerchief, her hands and legs were bound, and she was carried swooning with terror into a vaulted room, where she was placed by a person there waiting, and tied in an armchair. The same mask who had gagged her came and bared her neck, and said, It had best be done now she has fainted. Perhaps it would have been as well, for though she recovered from her swoon, and her confessor, who was present, came forward and endeavoured to prepare her for the awful deed which was about to be done upon her, and for the state into which she was about to enter, when she came to herself it was only to scream like a maniac, to curse the duke as a butcher and tyrant, and to call upon Magny, her dear Magny. At this the duke said quite calmly, May God have mercy on her sinful soul. He, the confessor, and Geldern, who were present, went down on their knees, and, as his highness dropped his handkerchief, Weissenborn fell down in a fainting fit, while M. de Strasbourg, taking the back hair in his hand, separated the shrieking head of Olivia from the miserable, sinful body. May heaven have mercy upon her soul. This was the story told by Madame de Liliengarten, and the reader will have no difficulty in drawing from it that part which affected myself and my uncle, who, after six weeks of arrest, were set at liberty, but with orders to quit the duchy immediately. Indeed, with an escort of dragoons to conduct us to the frontier. What property we had, we were allowed to sell and realize in money, but none of our play-debts were paid to us, 
and all my hopes of the Countess Ida were thus at an end. When Duke Victor came to the throne, which he did when, six months after, apoplexy carried off the old sovereign his father, all the good old usages of X were given up, play forbidden, the opera and ballet sent to the right about, and the regiments which the old duke had sold recalled from their foreign service. With them came my countess's beggarly cousin the ensign, and he married her. I don't know if they were happy or not. It is certain that a woman of such a poor spirit did not merit any very high degree of pleasure. The now reigning Duke of X himself married four years after his first wife's demise, and Geldern, though no longer police minister, built the grand house of which Madame de Liliengarten spoke. What became of the minor actors in the great tragedy, who knows? Only Monsieur de Strasbourg was restored to his duties. Of the rest, the Jew, the chamberwoman, the spy on Mani, I know nothing. Those sharp tools with which great people cut out their enterprises are generally broken in the using. Nor did I ever hear that their employers had much regard for them in their ruin. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of the Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Chapter Thirteen. I continue my career as a man of fashion. I find I have already filled up many scores of pages, and yet a vast deal of the most interesting portion of my history remains to be told, viz that which describes my sojourn in the kingdoms of England and Ireland, and the great part I played there, moving among the most illustrious of the land, myself not the least distinguished of the brilliant circle. In order to give due justice to this portion of my memoirs, then, which is more important than my foreign adventures can be, though I could fill volumes with interesting descriptions of the latter, I shall cut short the account of my travels in Europe and of my success at the continental courts in order to speak of what befell me at home. Suffice it to say that there is not a capital in Europe except the beggarly one of Berlin, where the young Chevalier de Balibéry was not known and admired, and where he has not made the brave, the high-born, and the beautiful talk of him. I won 80,000 roubles from Potemkin at the Winter Palace at Petersburg, which the scoundrelly favorite never paid me. I had the honor of seeing His Royal Highness the Chevalier Charles Edward as drunk as any porter at Rome. My uncle played several matches at billiards against the celebrated Lord C. at Spa, and I promise you did not come off a loser. In fact, by a neat stratagem of ours, we raised the laugh against his lordship and something a great deal more substantial. My lord did not know that the Chevalier Barry had a useless eye, and when, one day, my uncle playfully bet him odds at billiards that he would play him with a patch over one eye, the noble lord, thinking to bite us, he was one of the most desperate gamblers that ever lived, accepted the bet, and we won a very considerable amount of him. Nor need I mention my successes among the fairer portion of the creation. One of the most accomplished, the tallest, the most athletic, and the handsomest gentleman of Europe, as I was then, a young fellow of my figure could not fail of having advantages, which a person of my spirit knew very well how to use. But upon these subjects I am dumb. Charming Shuvalov, black-eyed Zatarska, Dark Valdez, tender Helgenheim, brilliant Langeac, oh, ye gentle hearts that knew how to beat in old times for the warm young Irish gentleman, where are you now? Though my hair has grown gray now, and my sight dim, and my heart cold with years, and ennui, and disappointment, and the treachery of friends, Yet I have but to lean back in my armchair and think, 
and those sweet figures come rising up before me out of the past, with their smiles and their kindnesses and their bright, tender eyes. There are no women like them now, no manners like theirs. Look you at a bevy of women at the prince's, stitched up in tight white satin sacks with their waists under their arms, and compare them to the graceful figures of the old time. Why, when I danced with Coralie de Langeac at the fete on the birth of the first Dauphin at Versailles, her hoop was eighteen feet in circumference, and the heels of her lovely little mules were three inches from the ground. The lace of my jabot was worth a thousand crowns, and the buttons of my amaranth velvet coat cost eighty thousand livres. Look at the difference now. The gentlemen are dressed like boxers, Quakers or hackney coachmen, and the ladies are not dressed at all. There's no elegance, no refinement, none of the chivalry of the old world of which I form a portion. Think of the fashion of London being led by a BR-MM-L. Footnote. This manuscript must have been written at the time when Mr. Brummel was the leader of the London fashion. End footnote. A nobody's son, a low creature who can no more dance a minuet than I can talk Cherokee, who cannot even crack a bottle like a gentleman, who never showed himself to be a man of the sword in his hand, as we used to approve ourselves in the good old times before that vulgar Corsican upset the gentry of the world. Oh, to see the Valdez once again, as on that day I met her first driving in state, with her eight mules and her retinue of gentlemen, by the side of yellow Manzanares. Oh, for another drive with Hagenheim in the gilded sledge over the Saxon snow. False as Shuvalov was, t'was better to be jilted by her than to be adored by any other woman. I can't think of any one of them without tenderness. I have ringlets of all their hair in my poor little museum of recollections. Do you keep mine, you dear souls that survive the turmoils and troubles of near half a hundred years? How changed its color is now, since the day Sitarska wore it round her neck, after my duel with Count Bernaski at Warsaw. I never kept any beggarly books of accounts in those days. I had no debts. I paid royally for everything I took, and I took everything I wanted. My income must have been very large. My entertainments and equipages were those of a gentleman of the highest distinction. Nor let any scoundrel presume to sneer because I carried off and married my Lady Linden, as you shall presently hear and call me an adventurer, or say I was penniless, or the match unequal. Penniless? I had the wealth of Europe at my command. Adventurer? So is a meritorious lawyer or a gallant soldier. So is every man who makes his own fortune an adventurer. My profession was play, in which I was then unrivaled. No man could play with me through Europe on the square, and my income was just as certain, during health and the exercise of my profession, as that of a man who draws on his three per cents, or any fat squire whose acres bring him revenue. Harvest is not more certain than the effect of skill is. A crop is a chance, as much as a game of cards greatly played by a fine player. There may be a drought, or a frost, or a hailstorm, and your stake is lost. But one man is just as much an adventurer as another. In evoking the recollection of these kind and fair creatures, I have nothing but pleasure. I would I could say as much of the memory of another lady, who will henceforth play a considerable part in the drama of my life. I mean the Countess of Linden whose fatal acquaintance I made at Spa, very soon after the events described in the last chapter had caused me to quit Germany. Honoria, Countess of Linden, 
Viscountess Bullingdon in England, Baroness Castle Linden of the Kingdom of Ireland, was so well known to the great world in her day that I have little need to enter into her family history, which is to be had in any peerage that the reader may lay his hand on. She was, as I need not say, a countess, a viscountess, and baroness in her own right. Her estates in Devon and Cornwall were among the most extensive in those parts, her Irish possessions not less magnificent, and they have been alluded to in a very early part of these memoirs, as lying near to my own paternal property in the kingdom of Ireland. Indeed, unjust confiscations in the time of Elizabeth and her father went to diminish my acres, while they added to the already vast possessions of the Linden family. The countess, when I first saw her at the assembly at Spa, was the wife of her cousin, the right honourable Sir Charles Reginald Linden, Knight of the Bath, and minister to George the Second and George the Third, at several of the smaller courts of Europe. Sir Charles Linden was celebrated as a wit and bon vivant, and could write love verses against Hanbury Williams, and make jokes with George Selwyn. He was a man of virtue, like Harry Walpole, with whom, and Mr. Gray, he had made a part of the grand tour, and was cited in a word as one of the most elegant and accomplished men of his time. I made this gentleman's acquaintance as usual at the play-table, of which he was a constant frequenter. Indeed, one could not but admire the spirit and gallantry with which he pursued his favourite pastime, for, though worn out by gout and a myriad of diseases, a cripple wheeled about in a chair and suffering pains of agony, yet you would see him every morning and every evening at his post behind the delightful green cloth. And if, as it would often happen, his own hands were too feeble or inflamed to hold the box, he would call the mains nevertheless, and have his valet or a friend to throw for him. I like this courageous spirit in a man. The greatest successes in life have been won by such indomitable perseverance. I was by this time one of the best-known characters in Europe, and the fame of my exploits, my duels, my courage at play, would bring crowds around me in any public society where I appeared. I could show reams of scented paper to prove this eagerness to make my acquaintance was not confined to the gentlemen only, but that I hate boasting, and only talk of myself in so far as it is necessary to relate myself's adventures, the most singular of any man's in Europe. Well, Sir Charles Linden's first acquaintance with me originated in the Right Honourable Knight's winning seven hundred pieces of me at piquet, for which he was almost my match. And I lost them with much good humour, and paid them, you may be sure, punctually. Indeed, I will say this for myself, that losing money at play never in the least put me out of good humour with the winner, and that whenever I found a superior, I was always ready to acknowledge and hail him. Linden was very proud of winning from so celebrated a person, and we contracted a kind of intimacy, which, however, did not for a while go beyond pump-room attentions, and conversations over the supper-table at play, but which gradually increased until I was admitted into his more private friendship. He was a very free-spoken man. The gentry of those days were much prouder than at present and used to say to me in his haughty, easy way, "'Hang it, Mr. Barry, you have no more manners than a barber, and I think my black footman has been better educated than you. But you are a young fellow of originality and pluck, and I like you, sir, because you seem determined to go to the deuce by a way of your own.' I would thank him laughingly for this compliment, and say that as he was bound to the next world much sooner than I— I would be obliged to him to get comfortable quarters arranged there for me. He used also to be immensely amused with my stories about the splendor of my family and the magnificence of Castle Brady. He would never tire of listening or laughing at those histories. Stick to the trumps, however, my lad, he would say when I told him of my misfortunes in the conjugal line, 
and how near I had been winning the greatest fortune in Germany. "'Do anything but marry, my artless Irish rustic,' he called me by a multiplicity of queer names. "'Cultivate your great talents in the gambling line. But mind this, that a woman will beat you.' That I denied, mentioning several instances in which I had conquered the most intractable tempers among the sex. Uh, they will beat you in the long run, my Tipperary Alcibiades. As soon as you are married, take my word of it, you are conquered. Look at me. I married my cousin, the noblest and greatest heiress in England. Married her in spite of herself, almost. Here a dark shade passed over Sir Charles Lyndon's countenance. She is a weak woman. You shall see, sir, how weak she is but she is my mistress. She has embittered my whole life. She is a fool, but she has got the better of one of the best heads in Christendom. She is enormously rich, but somehow I have never been so poor as since I married her. I thought to better myself, and she has made me miserable and killed me, and she will do as much for my successor when I am gone. "'Has her ladyship a very large income?' said I. At which Sir Charles burst into a yelling laugh, and made me blush not a little at my gaucherie, for the fact is, seeing him in the condition in which he was, I could not help speculating upon the chance a man of spirit might have with his widow. "'No, no,' said he, laughing. "'Wahawk, Mr. Barry!' Don't think if you value your peace of mind to stand in my shoes when they're vacant. Besides, I don't think my lady Linden would quite condescend to marry a... Marry a what, sir? said I, in a rage. Ah, uh, never mind what. But the man who gets her will rue it, take my word on it. A plague on her. Had it not been for my father's ambition and mine... He was her uncle and guardian, and wouldn't let such a prize out of the family. I might have died pleasantly, at least, carried my gout down to my grave in quiet, lived in my modest tenement in Mayfair, had every house in England open to me. And now, now I have six of my own, and every one of them is a hell to me. Beware of greatness, Mr. Barry. Take warning by me. Ever since I have been married and have been rich, I have been the most miserable wretch in the world. Look at me. I am dying a worn-out cripple at the age of fifty. Marriage has added forty years to my life. When I took off Lady Linden, there was no man of my years who looked so young as myself. Fool that I was. I had enough with my pensions. Perfect freedom, the best society in Europe. And I gave up all these, and married, and was miserable. Take a warning by me, Captain Barry, and stick to the trumps. Though my intimacy with the knight was considerable, for a long time I never penetrated into any other apartments of his hotel but those which he himself occupied. His lady lived entirely apart from him and it is only curious how they came to travel together at all. She was a goddaughter of old Mary Wortley Montague, and, like that famous old woman of the last century, made considerable pretensions to be a blue-stocking and a bel esprit. Lady Linden wrote poems in English and Italian, which still may be read by the curious in the pages of the magazines of the day. She entertained a correspondence with several of the European savants upon history, science, and ancient languages, and especially theology. Her pleasure was to dispute controversial points with abbés and bishops, and her flatterers said she rivaled Madame Dacier in learning. Every adventurer who had a discovery in chemistry, a new antique bust, or a plan for discovering the philosopher's stone, was sure to find a patroness in her. She had numberless works dedicated to her, 
and sonnets without end addressed to her by all the poetasters of Europe, under the name of Lindanira or Callista. Her rooms were crowded with hideous china magot and all sorts of objects of virtu. No woman piqued herself more upon her principles, or allowed love to be made to her more profusely. There was a habit of courtship practiced by the fine gentlemen of those days, which is little understood in our coarse, downright times, and young and old fellows would pour out floods of compliments in letters and madrigals, such as would make a sober lady stare were they addressed to her nowadays. So entirely has the gallantry of the last century disappeared out of our manners. Lady Linden moved about with a little court of her own. She had half a dozen carriages in her progresses. In her own she would travel with her companion, some shabby lady of quality, her birds and poodles and the favorite savant for the time being. In another would be her female secretary and her waiting women, who, in spite of their care, could never make their mistress look much better than a slattern. Sir Charles Linden had his own chariot, and the domestics of the establishment would follow in other vehicles. Also must be mentioned the carriage in which rode her lady's chaplain, Mr. Runt, who acted in capacity of governor to her son, the little Viscount Bullingdon, a melancholy deserted little boy, about whom his father was more than indifferent and whom his mother never saw, except for two minutes at her levee, when she would put to him a few questions of history or Latin grammar, after which he was consigned to his own amusements, or the care of his governor, for the rest of the day. The notion of such a Minerva as this, whom I saw in the public places now and then, surrounded by swarms of needy abbés and schoolmasters, who flattered her, frightened me for some time and I had not the least desire to make her acquaintance. I had no desire to be one of the beggarly adorers in the great lady's train. Fellows, half friend, half lackey, who made verses and wrote letters and ran errands content to be paid by a seat in her ladyship's box at the comedy or a cover at her dinner-table at noon. Don't be afraid, Sir Charles Linden would say whose great subject of conversation and abuse was his lady. My Lindanira will have nothing to do with you. She likes the Tuscan brogue, not that of Carey. She says you smell too much of the stable to be admitted to ladies' society. And last Sunday fortnight, when she did me the honor to speak to me last, said, I wonder, Sir Charles Linden, a gentleman who has been the king's ambassador can demean himself by gambling and boozing with low Irish blacklegs. <laughs> Don't fly in a fury. I I'm a cripple, and it was Lindenera said it, not I. This piqued me, and I was resolved to become acquainted with Lady Linden, if it were but to show her ladyship that the descendant of those berries whose property she unjustly held was not an unworthy companion for any lady, were she ever so high. Besides, my friend the knight was dying. His widow would be the richest prize in the three kingdoms. Why should I not win her, and, with her, the means of making in the world that figure which my genius and inclination desired? I felt I was equal in blood and breeding to any linden in Christendom and determined to bend this haughty lady. When I determine, I look upon the thing as done. My uncle and I talked the matter over, and speedily settled upon a method for making our approaches upon this stately lady of Castle Linden. Mr. Runt, young Bullingdon's governor, was fond of pleasure, of a glass of Rhenish in the garden-houses in the summer evenings, and of a sly throw of the dice when the occasion offered. And I took care to make friends with this person, who, being a college tutor and an Englishman, was ready to go on his knees to any one who resembled a man of fashion. Seeing me with my retinue of servants, my vis-a-vis -vis and chariots, my 
valets my hussar and horses dressed in gold and velvet and sables saluting the greatest people in europe as we met on the course or at the spas runt was dazzled by my advances and was mine by a beckoning of the finger i shall never forget the poor wretch's astonishment when i asked him to dine with two counts off gold plate at the little room in the casino he was made happy by being allowed to win a few pieces of us became exceedingly tipsy sang cambridge songs and recreated the company by telling us in his horrid yorkshire french stories about the gyps and all the lords that had ever been in his college i encouraged him to come and see me oftener and bring with him his little viscount for whom though the boy always detested me i took care to have a good stock of sweetmeats toys and picture books when he came I then began to enter into a controversy with Mr. Runt, and confided to him some doubts which I had, and a very, very earnest leaning towards the Church of Rome. I made a certain abbé, whom I knew, write me letters upon transubstantiation, etc., which the honest tutor was rather puzzled to receive. I knew that they would be communicated to his lady as they were. For, asking leave to attend the English service, which was celebrated in her apartments, and frequented by the best English then at the spa, on the second Sunday she condescended to look at me. On the third she was pleased to reply to my profound bow by a curtsy. The next day I followed up the acquaintance by another obeisance in the public walk and to make a long story short her ladyship and i were in full correspondence on transubstantiation before six weeks were over my lady came to the aid of her chaplain and then i began to see the prodigious weight of his arguments as was to be expected the progress of this harmless little intrigue need not be detailed I make no doubt every one of my readers has practiced similar stratagems when a fair lady was in the case. I shall never forget the astonishment of Sir Charles Lyndon, when, on one summer evening, as he was issuing out to the play-table in his sedan-chair, according to his wont, her ladyship's barouche and four, with her outriders in the tawny livery of the Lyndon family, came driving into the courtyard of the house which they inhabited and in that carriage, by her ladyship's side, sat no other than the vulgar Irish adventurer, as she was pleased to call him. I mean, Redmond Barry, Esquire. He made the most courtly of his bows, and grinned and waved his hat in as graceful a manner as the gout permitted. And her ladyship and I replied to the salutation, with the utmost politeness and elegance on our part. I could not go to the play-table for some time afterwards, for Lady Lyndon and I had an argument on transubstantiation, which lasted for three hours, in which she was, as usual, victorious, and in which her companion, the Honourable Miss Flint Skinner, fell asleep. But when, at last, I joined Sir Charles at the casino, he received me with a yell of laughter, as his wont was, and introduced me to all the company as Lady Lyndon's interesting young convert. This was his way. He laughed and sneered at everything. He laughed when he was in a paroxysm of pain. He laughed when he won money or when he lost it. His laugh was not jovial or agreeable, but rather painful and sardonic. Gentlemen, said he to Punter, Colonel Loder, Count de Carreau, and several jovial fellows with whom he used to discuss a flask of champagne and a Rhenish trout or two after play, see this amiable youth. He has been troubled by religious scruples, and has flown for refuge to my chaplain, Mr. Runt, 
who has asked for advice from my wife, Lady Lyndon, and, between them both, they are confirming my ingenious young friend in his faith. Did you ever hear of such doctors, and such a disciple? Faith, sir, said I, if I want to learn good principles, it's surely better I should apply for them to your lady and your chaplain than to you. He wants to step into my shoes, continued the knight. The man would be happy who did so, responded I, provided there were no chalk stones included. At which reply Sir Charles was not very well pleased, and went on with increased rancor. He was always free-spoken in his cups, and, to say the truth, he was in his cups many more times in a week than his doctors allowed. "'Is it not a pleasure, gentlemen?' said he, for me, as I am drawing near the goal, to find my home such a happy one, my wife so fond of me, that she is even now thinking of appointing a successor. I don't mean you precisely, Mr. Barry. You are only taking your chance with a score of others whom I could mention. Isn't it a comfort to see her, like a prudent housewife, getting everything ready for her husband's departure? I hope you are not thinking of leaving us soon, Knight, said I with perfect sincerity, for I liked him as a most amusing companion. Not so soon, my dear, as you may fancy, perhaps, continued he. Why, man, I have been given over any time these four years, and there was always a candidate or two waiting to apply for this situation. Who knows how long I may keep you waiting? And he did keep me waiting some little time longer than at that period there was any reason to suspect. As I declared myself pretty openly, according to my usual way, and authors are accustomed to describe the persons of the ladies with whom their heroes fall in love, in compliance with this fashion I perhaps should say a word or two respecting the charms of my Lady Linden. But though I celebrated them in many copies of verses of my own and other persons' writing, and though I filled reams of paper in the passionate style of those days with compliments to every one of her beauties and smiles, in which I compared her to every flower, goddess, or famous heroine ever heard of, truth compels me to say that there was nothing divine about her at all. She was very well, but no more. Her shape was fine, her hair dark, her eyes good and exceedingly active. She loved singing, but performed it as so great a lady should, very much out of tune. She had a smattering of half a dozen modern languages, and, as I have said before, of many more sciences than I even knew the names of. She piqued herself on knowing Greek and Latin, but the truth is that Mr. Runt, used to supply her with the quotations that she introduced into her voluminous correspondence. She had as much love of admiration, as strong, uneasy a vanity, and as little heart as any woman I ever knew. Otherwise, when her son, Lord Bullingdon, on account of his differences with me, ran, but that matter shall be told in its proper time. Finally, my Lady Linden was about a year older than myself, though, of course, she would take her Bible oath that she was three years younger. Few men are so honest as I am. So few will own to their real motives, and I don't care a button about confessing mine. What Sir Charles Linden said was perfectly true. I made the acquaintance of Lady Linden with ulterior views. Sir, said I to him, when, after the scene described, and the jokes he made upon me, we met alone, let those laugh that win. You were very pleasant upon me a few nights since, and on my intentions regarding your lady. Well, if they are what you think they are. If I do wish to step into your shoes, what then? I have no other intentions than you had yourself. I'll be sworn to muster just as much regard for my Lady Linden as you ever showed her. And if I win her and wear her when you are dead and gone, 
Corbler knight, do you think it will be the fear of your ghost will deter me? Linden laughed as usual, but somewhat disconcertedly. Indeed, I had clearly the best of him in the argument, and had just as much right to hunt my fortune as he had. But one day, he said, if you marry such a woman as my lady Linden, mark my words, you will regret it. You will pine after the liberty you once enjoyed. By George, Captain Barry, he added with a sigh, the thing that I regret most in life, perhaps it is because I am old, blasé, and dying, is that I never had a virtuous attachment. Ha <laughs> ha, a milkmaid's daughter, said I, laughing at the absurdity. Well, why not a milkmaid's daughter? My good fellow, I was in love in youth, as most gentlemen are, with my tutor's daughter, Helena, a bouncing girl, of course older than myself. This made me remember my own little love passages with Nora Brady in the days of my early life. And do you know, sir, I heartily regret I didn't marry her. There's nothing like having a virtuous drudge at home, sir. Depend upon that. It gives a zest to one's enjoyments in the world, take my word for it. No man of sense need restrict himself, or deny himself a single amusement for his wife's sake. On the contrary, if he select the animal properly, he will choose such a one as shall be no bar to his pleasure, but a comfort in his hours of annoyance. For instance, I have got the gout. Who tends me? A hired valet, who robs me whenever he has the power. My wife never comes near me. What friend have I? None in the wide world. Men of the world, as you and I are, don't make friends, and we are fools for our pains. Get a friend, sir, and that friend a woman, a good household drudge who loves you. That is the most precious sort of friendship, for the expense of it is all on the woman's side. The man needn't contribute anything. If he's a rogue, she'll vow he's an angel. If he's a brute, she will like him all the better for his ill-treatment of her. They like it, sir, these women. They are born to be our greatest comforts and conveniences, our, our moral boot-jacks, as it were. And to men in your way of life, believe me, such a person would be invaluable. I am only speaking for your bodily and mental comfort's sake, mind. Why didn't I marry poor Helena Flower, the curate's daughter? I thought these speeches the remarks of a weakly disappointed man. Although since, perhaps, I have had reason to find the truth of Sir Charles Linden's statements. The fact is, in my opinion, that we often buy money very much too dear. To purchase a few thousands a year at the expense of an odious wife is very bad economy for the young fellow of any talent and spirit. And there have been moments of my life when, in the midst of my greatest splendor and opulence, with a half a dozen lords at my levee, with the finest horses in my stables, the grandest house over my head, with unlimited credit at my bankers, and Lady Linden to boot. I have wished myself back a private of Bulos, or anything, so as to get rid of her. To return, however, to the story. Sir Charles, with his complication of ills, was dying before us by inches, and I've no doubt it could not have been very pleasant to him to see a young, handsome fellow paying court to his widow before his own face, as it were. After I once got into the house on the transubstantiation dispute, I found a dozen more occasions to improve my intimacy, and was scarcely ever out of her ladyship's doors. The world talked and blustered, but what cared I? The men cried fie upon the shameless Irish adventurer, but I have told my way of silencing such envious people, and my sword by this time got such a reputation through Europe that few people cared to encounter it. 
if I can once get my hold of a place, I keep it. Many's the house I've been to where I've seen the men avoid me. Fah, the low Irishman, they would say. Bah, the coarse adventurer. Out on the insufferable blackleg and puppy, and so forth. This hatred has been of no inconsiderable service to me in the world, for when I fasten on a man, nothing can induce me to release my hold, and I am left to myself, which is all the better. As I told Lady Linden in those days, with perfect sincerity, Callista, I used to call her Callista in my correspondence, Callista, I swear to thee by the spotlessness of thy own soul, by the brilliancy of thy immitigable eyes, by everything pure and chaste in heaven, and in thy own heart, that I will never cease from following thee. Scorn I can bear, and have borne at thy hands. Indifference I can surmount. Tis a rock which my energy will climb over, a magnet which attracts the dauntless iron of my soul. And it was true. I wouldn't have left her. No, though they had kicked me downstairs, every day I presented myself at her door. That is my way of fascinating women. Let the man who has to make his fortune in life remember this maxim. Attacking is his only secret. Dare, and the world always yields. Or, if it beat you sometimes, dare again, and it will succumb. In those days my spirit was so great, that if I had set my heart upon marrying a princess of the blood, I would have had her. I told Callista my story, and altered very, very little of the truth. My object was to frighten her, to show her that what I wanted, that I dared, that what I dared that I won. And there were striking passages enough in my history to convince her of my iron will and indomitable courage. Never hope to escape me, madam, I would say. Offer to marry another man, and he dies upon this sword, which never yet met its master. Fly from me, and I will follow you, though it were to the gates of Hades. I promise you this was very different language to that which she had been in the habit of hearing from her jemmy jessamy adorers. You should have seen how I scared the fellows from her. When I said in this energetic way that I would follow Lady Linden across the sticks if necessary, of course I meant that I would do so, provided nothing more suitable presented itself in the interim. If Linden would not die, what was the use of my pursuing the Countess? And somehow, towards the end of the spa season, very much to my mortification I do confess, the knight made another rally. It seemed as if nothing would kill him. I am sorry for you, Captain Barry, he would say, laughing as usual. I am grieved to keep you or any gentleman waiting. Had you not better arrange with my doctor or get the cook to flavor my omelette with arsenic? What are the odds, gentlemen, he would add, that I don't live to see Captain Barry hanged yet? In fact, the doctors tinkered him up for a year. It's my usual luck, I could not help saying to my uncle, who was my confidential and most excellent adviser in all matters of the heart. I've been wasting the treasures of my affection upon that flirt of a countess, and here's her husband restored to health, and likely to live I don't know how many years. And, as if to add to my mortification, there came just at this period to Spa an English tallow-chandler's heiress, with a plum to her fortune, and Madame Cornu, the widow of a Norman cattle-dealer and farmer-general, with a dropsy and two hundred livres a year. What's the use of my following the Lindens to England, said I, if the knight won't die? Don't follow them, my dear simple child, replied my uncle. Stop here and pay court to the new arrivals. Yes, and lose Callista forever, and the greatest estate in all England. <sighs> pooh, pooh, youths like you easily fire and easily despond. 
keep up a correspondence with Lady Linden. You know there's nothing she likes so much. There's the Irish Abbe, who will write you the most charming letters for a crown apiece. Let her go, write to her, and meanwhile look out for anything else which may turn up. Who knows? You might marry the Norman widow, bury her, take her money, and be ready for the countess against the knight's death. And so, with vows of the most profound, respectful attachment, and having given twenty louis to Lady Linden's waiting-woman for a lock of her hair, of which fact, of course, the woman informed her mistress, I took leave of the countess, when it became necessary for her to return to her estates in England, swearing I would follow her as soon as an affair of honour I had on my hands could be safely brought to an end. I shall pass over the events of the year that ensued before I again saw her. She wrote to me according to promise, with much regularity at first, with somewhat less frequency afterwards. My affairs, meanwhile, at the play-table, went on not unprosperously, and I was just on the point of marrying the widow Cornu. We were at Brussels by this time, and the poor soul was madly in love with me, when the London Gazette was put into my hands, and I read the following announcement. Died at Castle Linden, in the Kingdom of Ireland, the Right Honourable Sir Charles Linden, Knight of the Bath, Member of Parliament for Linden in Devonshire, and many years His Majesty's representative at various European courts. He hath left behind him a name which is endeared to all his friends for his manifest virtues and talents a reputation justly acquired in the service of his majesty, and an inconsolable widow to deplore his loss. Her ladyship, the bereaved Countess of Linden, was at the bath when the horrid intelligence reached her of her husband's demise, and hastened to Ireland immediately in order to pay her last sad duties to his beloved remains. That very night, I ordered my chariot and posted to Ostend, where I freighted a vessel to Dover, and, travelling rapidly into the west, reached Bristol, from which port I embarked for Waterford, and found myself, after an absence of eleven years, in my native country. End of chapter 13